It's never too late to say you're sorry It's never too late to begin again What love always gives you a second chance Who knows where And who knows where Hello, it's Dana Gillespie here with another Glow Trotting with Gillespie and we're here at the Temple of Art and Music and as usual I have to wrap up my bangles because they make the most terrible clonking sound when I'm talking so you know we've had lots of different people on Globe Trotting but this is what we're going to, I'm going to talk to somebody who's got a very different type of story and I think it's important that this story is told. I'd like you all to meet Nina Olk. Thank you. Hi. Now, Nina, I saw a couple of your podcasts after we met last time, which was a couple of months ago. Yeah. And your story is quite, for some people, very horrific. Can you sort of, in a nutshell, tell me what it is? It's about honour killings as That's well. Right, yeah. Tell me how your in, you know, tell me your story or tell the viewers, but tell sure. me. Okay, so now I'm Nina Olk. I'm a TEDx speaker, professional speaker. My job title is that I'm a mindset coach for UFC fighters and fighters all around the world, um, quite well known ones. But my passion, my heart is talking about honor killings and human trafficking because I survived an honor killing at the age of 21 and my sister was sold to traffickers when she was six years old by our father. And you've never heard from her again? Well, where he left her is a place where they harvest organs in India. India is known to be one of the top places to go when you want to buy an organ. Um, they, people pay a lot of money and they tend to take children and for, that, for that reason. Did you know this was good? How old, much younger was your younger sister? Well, this Gee. happened 20 years after my attempted honour killing. And an honour yeah. killing is where they kill you because you brought shame. In our language, we say izzat, which you might know that word. Yeah. Um, but if you bring shame to the family, be it you've worn something that shows your arms or is seen incorrectly. For me, it was a case of I'd left a forced arranged marriage as a child. I'd left, um, and for that reason, they tried to kill me. How old were you when this potential forced arranged marriage was thrust on you? So I was um, traded, as I call it, to somebody um, for the exchange of money. Um, it's not necessarily dowry, it's slightly different, but I was 14 turning 15. You tell me about the thing that happened on the table with your father and yeah. his mates, and the, maybe tell me again, because yeah, it's... Sure. So my life was very different. I was literally a modern day slave from the age of six. And that was normal because it's normal for a lot of girls in my culture. But at the age of 14, I was horrifically raped in a gang raping with my father and his drunk friends, um, which led to a pregnancy, which led to an abortion, which led to nobody wanting me because I was a girl and I had been damaged. I was damaged goods. But my father said I had created that shame upon myself. So to fix it, one of the perpetrators came forward and said he would take me um, as his person. So I went from my father's home to one of the people that had raped me of my father's age. Um, and I was kept in a small room downstairs as a domestic servant again. And I was sexually abused for four years. How on earth did you escape from this? Well, when I decided enough was enough, I went back to my mother and father's home thinking, they're my parents, right? Um, I dreamt and romanticized being held, being loved, because that's what I, I needed desperately. Mm -hmm. um, and when I was beaten, they broke my arm, my jaw, as I say in my TED talk, they'd literally broken me down completely as a person, physically and mentally. And I lay in a bath of my own blood um, and I was left for three days and I knew they were going to finish me off by sending me to India, which was the normal thing they do. So I escaped by crawling away and I feel there was a rebirth at that point in my life um, because I was literally crawling like a baby to escape. Where did you crawl to? Well, I managed to get out of the house, which was an ordeal in itself, 
Because um, they what they kept doors locked. Doors or? were locked. There were angry people in the home. You know, noises were. I was a frightened person all my life. I'd lived in fear, um, but I managed to escape into a park across the road from our home, and I passed out with the injuries. And when I woke up, it was four in the morning, and I ma managed to somehow. It's a mindset thing, which is probably why I'm a coach now. But my mind was determined not to give up, and I made it to a taxi rank who got me to safety. Gosh, that was a piece of luck, actually, because you might have met somebody yes. else with the same... I believe other... in angels, I do. Thank so... goodness. So this whole awful episode, I mean, it's almost indescribable. For people here in the West, you think this can't be going on, but it is, even in Britain, dare it one is. say it? Um, the reason I spoke out was because I realised by not holding my father accountable, he had thought he was able to do more and he did that with my younger sister she was actually half my sister mm. he'd had an affair and to hide his affair he'd taken her away to India and, and literally sold her now had I have spoken up maybe he would have thought twice but in our culture we don't say anything girls are very silenced you know we live in fear we don't speak we're very um, our language is more sort of sign language because we're not supposed to be seen or heard so I spoke out because I felt it was a social requirement for me to stand up so other people would stand up and understand <clears> they're not alone. Well, if it's going on to other people, I mean, do you have advice? Where, where can people turn to? How can they try and get the strength that you had to get out of this? So it's not easy asking for help. It really isn't. No. And you feel that you're so consumed in this culture that you'll become... You'll become a person on their own, which is what I am, I'm disowned. So you lose your community, you lose your identity. But what I say to girls is there's so much more to life than fear. There is love, which is exactly what I'm full of. There's the sign which you can show to people, which you hold your hand out, put your thumb in and close it, which means you're trapped. And people in restaurants, airports understand this sign. But it's hard to do if you've got a parent with you. Um, so it's really difficult. But I would say to them to find the strength within and any chance they have to, to leave, to definitely leave. This sign, by the way, because I didn't know about sure. it. This is something, who would recognise it? If I put my hand... So it's, yeah, so you hold your hand out, you put your thumb in, which yeah. means I'm trapped, and you close it. It can be any hand, really. So but it's worldwide. Who is it? Yeah, people recognise it in restaurants, health officials recognise it, the police know it. Um, people ha people's lives have been saved because of this sign. I also say to people, if you're being trafficked or forced out of the country, place a metal object into your underwear if you can, that will set off the, um, the, you know, the barriers and then you can quietly say help and they will take you into a different room and that's where you will definitely get looked after. Uh, any other useful, I never thought, of, that's brilliant, that yeah. bit of metal. Any other things that can help people? No, I mean, talking is great because you feel, we, we become consumed with this heavy weight, this heavy burden of being a victim of abuse or domestic violence or, you know, mental abuse is terrible in Asian cultures too. Um, so talking about it really helps. And there is a stigma attached that we cannot talk out. But I would say to anybody listening, if you're suffering from anything, to please speak to somebody. Yeah, I guess, though, if you're in a family home, the somebodies may all be connected to the parents or the family circle. How long did it take you to feel that you'd somehow healed yourself to be strong enough to be yeah. talking in all the TED Talks and things that you do now? Well, I'm, I was homeless six years ago because of domestic violence. and. That led me to a self-discovery, um, a journey. And I'm 52 now, and two years ago I discovered me. I was grounding because I'm very spiritual. I was standing in my garden with no shoes on, literally saying my affirmations to the universe. And I felt a real surge of acceptance that not anything that anybody had told me that I was too fat, I was too ugly, I wasn't clever enough, none of that mattered. It was their perception of me, not who I wanted to be or who I was. And I decided I would decide and I would encourage anybody out there that's struggling with anybody else's dialogue to create your own, to be who you want to be. Yeah, and they, also if somebody's awful to you or to anybody, they're the one with the problem, actually, exactly. although you have to deal with it. 
I think that's amazingly brave what you've been doing. Well, not brave is actually the wrong word. It's really good. It must be good to be able to tell people, because I know that you're helping others. You just told me before we started filming about yeah. the girl. Was it she in Pakistan? Yeah, I was helping somebody in Pakistan recently. So your mission now is to go out and talk to get people used to this these kind of things going on yeah. and how they can stand up and be strong and live in love. If people don't live in love, yeah. everything goes wrong. And yeah. nothing, you may think you can win for a while, but it won't last. No, it's, it's, it's um, with love comes freedom, but I feel so overwhelmed with love, I want to literally grab everybody and say, come here, I've got this amazing secret <laughs> and I want you to have it. <laughs> and with that comes freedom. You know, if I had the ideal job, it would be, writing letters to everybody and saying this is how I see you so when they read that letter they manifest that love for themselves because it truly sets you free. I think people don't um, often underestimate the power of love I mean it's yeah. so easy to just uh, say love this or I love that but it's it's the biggest it's the only thing without it what's the point? I always say to people Often um, when I'm doing a podcast, you know, we have trigger warnings, but I say that I'm armed, I'm armed, I'm we I've weaponized love so that I can love the fear out of people, I can love the fear out of the way they've been brought up. And I'm born and raised in this country as we were discussing, yeah. so this happens all over the world because not everybody that's from India is living in India, not everybody from Africa is living in Africa, the Middle East, we're such a diverse community now, so, yeah. so unfortunately they've taken their idealisms of cultural crimes and brought it to all around the world and imposed them upon their children. Well, I want to thank you, Nina, so much for even just talking about this. We'll try and get the message as, to as many people as we can. And I know you're doing great guns doing this. So thank you to Nina Olk for, for actually coming on Globe Trotting. Yes, thank and you. of course I got my hands in my <laughs> scarf, but um, you know, messages like this are so important and you're doing a a great service to mankind. Is one allowed to say mankind, womankind and all the other kind? It's just kindness. We are all one, aren't we? We're one. We are one. Love all, serve all and we are all one. That's the message. Yes? Yes. <laughs> Thank you, Nina, from Globetrotting here at the Temple of Art and Music. Goodbye till next time. Hate the sin. Hate the sin. Hate the sin, hate the sin Oh, hate the sin Hate the sin Love the sin Love the sin mm -hmm. Hate the sin, hate the sin Yeah.